and welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Pyrus M. And I'm Snake. And we are short a sen this week because, because something... I murdered him. And he's not on the show anymore. Daniel replaced him permanently. Ha ha ha. Die, Sen, die. Yeah, it's gonna take me a while to get the impression right down, so am I supposed to be going like, Alright guys, we got... Then uh, I'll work on that. <laughs> no, he's, he's much more flat. <laughs> and old. Right, a little more like... He almost sounds like Kermit the Frog sometimes, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm so glad he doesn't actually listen to this podcast so we can, like, talk smack about him all we want. Uh, Sen, you sense... have a flat butt. <laughs> okay, I'm not even gonna to go there. Sen has something to do with, like, a job. Or he has to, like, work or something dumb. Anyway. Okay. Sell out. Excuses. So he is going to join me for a uh, our DMC review later in the week, uh, but we wanted to get this out to you at the normally scheduled time, so... Uh, Oscars 2013. Zong. I have not seen as many of the movies on this list as I would have liked, but Same I here. have seen The Best Picture. Now, I'm very excited about it, because... It is my... It is one of the best pictures in my heart. Okay, so should we go over the nominees first? Yeah. Leave the winner for last? All right. Uh, so the best picture nominees were Amour, Beasts of the Southern Wild, Django Unchained, uh, Les Mis, Life of Pi, Lincoln, Silver Linings Playbook, and Zero Dark Thirty. And the winner was Argo! Ben Affleck's spy thriller. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Which, how did you put it? Was Stress the Movie? <laughs> It is super stressful to watch that movie. Like, you just sit there and they have to replace the arms on the seats after they show that movie in a theater for too long because people just clench them too hard and they break. On this list, I have seen Django and Argo, and that is it. Hmm. Uh, Lincoln? I have not seen Lincoln. Oh, well, you should, because it was good. Yes, I have seen only Lincoln, Django, and Les Mis. So, I haven't seen exactly the cheeriest of films. <laughs> Kinda of think of it, none of these are very cheery, are they? One's about killing Osama Bin Laden. One's about... Well, Lincoln's pretty, pretty not so grim, not so cheery. Les Mis, well, it's all in the title. Django Unchained, about slavery in America, yay. <sighs> Amour, an elderly aging couple. Life of Pi, a starving boy stuck on a lifeboat with a tiger. But grimmer Fantastic. still. Directed by the director of Hulk. Hmm. True enough, true enough. <laughs> Sorry, that was my chair. But yes. Sure. This is not exactly the happiest of, ye of nominees, was it? Well, I guess that's how the Academy kind of tends to lean. Hmm. Yeah. I would have a hard time if you presented this list to me before I knew the winner, picking between Django and Argo, because those are both fantastic movies. I feel like Hollywood has kind of been hitting it out of the park lately. More than in previous years. Just a lot of really good movies coming out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it depends on the specific genre of film, because this was not exactly the best year for animation, I'm afraid. I loved Wreck-It Ralph. I love, love, loved Wreck-It Ralph. Oh, Wreck-It Ralph was good, no doubt. Surprised it's not on this list anywhere. I mean, like, at all. Was it not in the date category? Animated feature film. That's its own category. Yes, but this wasn't exactly the... The who's who of big time lists here. We had Wreck It Ralph, the Pirates, the Pirates Band of Misfits, which I found incredibly underwhelming. It had one or two good jokes, but everything else was just so bland. Paranorman, which I hear was really good. Frank and Weenie, which seemed almost like the exact same thing. Another Tim Burton shtick. And Brave, which I need to be perfectly honest was probably Pixar's weakest work. And yet it won. Yeah, that's what kind of ticks me off a little bit. I'm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think my whole thing with Brave was, like, it was not the movie I was expecting it to be. Uh, yeah, you I... go in and you think it's, like, a teen girl rebellion slash lady power thing, and it turns out to be a mother-daughter buddy film with bears. That sounded really boring until you got to the part with the bears. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like brother bear reverse, and with mother-daughter. I... <laughs> and of course, not having the super best relationship with my mother, uh, I couldn't exactly relate super well. Yeah, but the uh, the setup was... It seemed almost like it was setting up for a different movie altogether. Yeah, it was just like, psych, this movie's about bears now. <laughs> <laughs> all, that, all, this, all the stuff that you saw in the trailers, and like everything that I thought was going to be important in like 
the first 20 minutes, like, all that kind of just goes out the window. I mean, yes, admittedly, and also all the other side characters were incredibly lacking also. I mean, the main character, yes, she was interesting enough for a while, but the dad, all these other guys, the the sons from the different locations, I mean, even the mother, nothing really, no, no real characters you actually care about, nothing that you even... Nothing we're used to coming from Pixar. We're used to having these really in-depth characters we love and that we're, we want to see them achieve and get through their obstacles. These people were just watching stuff happen to them. They're like, eh, okay, that's going on. Okay, cool. Where's Wally? <laughs> I mean, that's, I think that's the problem there. I think Pixar has forgotten exactly how to write stories about actual people. I mean, you get things like Toy Story, Cars, and uh, WALL-E, and all these other... Where we're getting non-human things that are really in-depth and, and you really care about. And we try, they tried to stories about people. And Incredibles was good, but lately... <sighs> what I'm saying is people suck. That's what I'm saying. I can get on board with that. Yes. People suck because they ruin Pixar movies. People being the people who work at Pixar... No, they're cool. Just the people in the... Yeah, I don't know. I'm ranting. I'm not sure you can assign the agency for ruining the movies to the characters and not to the creators. In the end, Brave looked good, sounded good, but it had no substance to it, I thought. Yeah, Frank and Weenie, Tim Burton is being Tim Burton like he's continued to be forever. Well, you see Edward Scissorhands and then no other Tim Burton movies and you're probably good. I don't know, maybe his Batman stuff. Maybe. Did either of you see that movie? Because I didn't. Frank and Wee? Uh, yeah. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> uh, I really just didn't seem to be of interest to me. I don't know. I just don't think I was the target audience for that. I feel bad about not having seen so many movies on this list, but it's like, okay, people tell you when you're trying to exercise that there's always enough time if you make enough time. And I feel like I spend a lot of time watching movies and still don't have enough time to watch all the movies. Like, well, should I be making more time to slack more? Well, because most of the time, the movies that we typically watch are not the ones that are being nominated. These are all the rather high-end ones, the ones for the more snobbish people. Oh, my! <laughs> we never actually see, except maybe once in a blue moon or so. Or just once so we can tell our parents, yes, we did see this. Stop nagging us to see it again. <laughs> and no warm bodies on this list. There's that too. Anywho, shall we keep going then? Since we've kind of jumped around a bit anyway. Sure, sure. why not? Uh, Alright, so best actor in a leading role. Ah. Uh, we'll start with the nominees and end on the winner. Uh, Bradley Cooper for Silver Linings Playbook. Hugh Jackman in Les Mis. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix in The Master. And Denzel Washington in flight, and the winner was Daniel Day Lewis as Lincoln, which heck yeah, that was amazing. I'm pretty sure that was a surprise to nobody. Although I've only seen two of these movies, so I can only vouch for two of the performances. But I think everyone knew Daniel Day Lewis was the one to beat. He, he and did he, awesome. Mm -hmm. He was one of my main attractions in trying to see that movie. Like, partially, it has a generic name, but when I was telling people about it, I was like, I want to go see the Daniel Day Lewis Lincoln movie. So I, I, I just want to see the movie that has Daniel Day-Lewis in it. Hmm. You good there? Yes, well. I mean, what else can you say about it? I mean, Daniel did a phenomenal job. Every time he was on screen, he was just owning everything he was in. Something about those Daniels. Yes, I don't know what it is. Not to mention, it's a very jarring change from what you might have seen in it if you saw him in Gangs of New York. <laughs> yeah. The guy definitely has a bit of a range. You can go from American Scumbag to American Savior. So we can get the two polar ends, so... That's got all of his bases covered, I'd say. I don't know anything about Silver Linings Playbook, but I just assume it's a rom-com, just based on the name. Am I right about that? I never saw it. I That was the impression that I got, but I also did not actually watch it. Yep. I, don't know what, I don't know what it is, I just did not like the title. Silver Linings Playbook, it just... I don't know why, it just reminded me of The Notebook and seemed like that was not something meant for me. A quick search on Google. Romantic comedy drama. Yep, it's well, a rom-com. So what else do you want? Which means it was precisely not meant for me because I hate those. <laughs> yeah. 
Unless they have zombies in them. Then they're awesome. Turns out, yeah. Now, the master. Uh, what's that one about? Because, again, another one I haven't seen. So, as far as I know, it's a Doctor Who movie from the other side. That would be a movie that I would want to see. I'm going to see the other Time Lord going around doing stuff. It is directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, which I know of for Boogie Nights, which is, like, super a long time ago and a weird basis to have any credit for this movie, but... <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to quote Wikipedia here. Freddie Quell is a sex-obsessed alcoholic World War II veteran suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and possible brain damage from drinking torpedo juice, struggling to adjust in a post-war society, having had questionable mental status before the war. So, it sounds like a fun movie. I don't know, I'm... Um, yeah. The IMDB summary reads, Returning from Navy service in World War II, Freddy Quell drifts through a series of PTSD-driven breakdowns. Finally, he stumbles upon a cult, which engages in exercises to clear emotions, and he becomes deeply involved with them. So, yeah. Hmm. Very cheery, is what we're saying. <laughs> so, once again, we are keeping the uplifting, happy-go-lucky feel of the Oscars this year, as always. And also more movies that I probably should have seen, but didn't get around to actually seeing. For most of us. in a leading role. So, yeah. Uh, I had to go look up some pronunciations because heaven help me. <laughs> I know the child actress that you are referring to. <laughs> okay, so um, Jessica Chastain in Zero Dark Thirty, uh, Emmanuel Riva in Amor, Naomi Watts in The Impossible. Uh, hang on, I have the Wikipedia open for this one. May the force be with you on this. I'm not going to help you with any editing here. <laughs> Quavenzene Wallace um, in Beasts of the Southern Wild, who I guess is the youngest nominee. Like, Nine years old. Yeah. Wasn't she like five when she did it, though? Oh, six. She was just six during the filming. So, yeah. Well, there you go. Well, that is certainly something to take to your elementary school show and tell. Uh, but six. she did not win. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence got it for Silver Linings Playbook. Big surprise to a couple people. And not really. I guess she's, like, the latest, like, oh my god, she's so hot. At least according to Reddit. <laughs> Fair enough. But the sad thing is, though, even after winning that Oscar, you know that she's only going to be known as the girl that tripped while going up to get her Oscar. Reddit still thinks she's cute. Well, there's that, too. Kind of reminds me of Ellen Page, in a way. I don't know why. Just has the same kind of face, I guess. Also, unfortunately, she's already been typecasted as Katniss. Mm -hmm. But still can manage to pull off an Oscar-winning performance as someone else. Yeah, I so think that, do the that probably gives you some immunity to typecasting. True. <laughs> no, instead she got an Oscar for a rom-com. How about that? <laughs> yeah, she got she got an Oscar for a rom-com and not the one where she's committing murder. So, there's that. Uh, moving yeah. on. Uh, actor in a supporting role. Um, Alan Arkin in Argo, Robert De Niro in Silver Linings Playbook, Philip Seymour Hoffman in The Master, Tommy Lee Jones in Lincoln, who... Would have been my pick, I think, next to somebody who didn't get nominated. Um, was I really thought uh, Leonardo DiCaprio did awesome in Django Unchanged, but instead they nominated the other white guy, Christoph Waltz, who won. Well, personally, that one did not surprise me because, well, Christoph Waltz just has this, I don't know, scene. He did steal with every scene that he was in, but I, every, I, feel yeah, like, that's what... I feel like Leo really deserved that. I feel like movies amazing. might have the backwards trend of video games where villains are unlikely to get nominated because uh, Leonardo DiCaprio did a powerful job of making you hate him in Django Unchained, which is exactly what he needed to do. But, I don't know, maybe if you're sitting on a nominating committee, you're like, I'm not going to nominate that guy. I hate him. <laughs> so you're saying nominate, you're saying these committees are just the same as five-year-olds with their Disney villain villains? Pretty much. Okay, then. I personally didn't surprise. I mean, that was probably the reason why they had to kill Christoph Waltz for the ending of Django, just because, you know, it would have just taken the focus completely away <clears throat> from Django if his if the Doctor was still alive, because he was just that great a character. Also, he even quoted his character on the stage. That was cool, too. Mm -hmm. I personally, it was, for me, with the nominees, it, it was between be... Christoph Waltz and Tommy Lee Jones, mm -hmm. because it's Tommy Lee Jones just being Tommy Lee Jones. And he was really good at it. Oh, yes. That was him at his peak. I mean, if Kristoff wasn't nominated, Tommy Lee would have gotten that. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you said yourself, Pixie, that he is just a man born to insult people. That's all he does in Lincoln. He's very good at it. Um, yeah, the, as Pyro was starting to point out, it seems to be like the reverse trend from video games where the voice acting awards generally tend to go to villains because, well, protagonists don't tend to get a whole lot of lines. Uh, for example, uh, last year in 2012, uh, best performance by a human male went to Damian Clark who, for his performance as Handsome Jack in Borderlands 2. Um, I think in 2000... Was it 11? Yeah, 2011, it went to Wheatley, who was technically the antagonist of Portal 2. Um, 2010... Went to... Hmm. Okay, so it went to Spider-Man that year. What? I think... Mm. I kind of swore the Elusive Man got one one year, but... Nah, he must have been just a nominee. Michael Douglas was an amazing casting choice as the Elusive Man. Uh, perhaps for me in particular, and probably for a lot of other people like me, because I don't, I guess they modeled the elusive man's face after, um, I just said his name and I forgot his name. GJ. But I, I look at the elusive man and I'm like, President Jed Bartlett, I love you, Jed Bartlett, but then you're such a bad guy and I hate you and it's confusing me. Yes, well, in any case, it does seem like Oscars do not particularly like bad guys that much. No matter how good of a job they do at making you hate them. So, we'll move on to actress. Sure thing. In a All supporting right. role. Best actress in a supporting role. We had nominees Amy Adam and the Master. Amy, Amy Adams, excuse me. She's plural. Uh, Sally Field in Lincoln. Uh, Helen Hunt in The Sessions. Jackie Weaver in Silver Lang's Playbook. And our winner was Anne Hathaway in Les Mis, which I'm sure... I, got, I don't know about you guys, but I got tons of texts about that because... Oh, hey, look, the lady with the short hair won. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have sent you that text then. I don't know. I was thinking, hey, look, Catwoman won. Yeah, There's Catwoman. <laughs> yeah, Catwoman with the right hair this time, right? Yeah, oh my gosh. I'm still disappointed they didn't do it for The Dark Knight Rises, but, you know, maybe that's just me. Would have been perfect. I'm just saying. What if it's more practical for Selena? Still, you think the pixie cut's gonna be a bit more popular now with Anne Hathaway getting that Oscar? Well, I don't know. She was kind of playing a dying prostitute, so. <laughs> <laughs> but she looked on stage. Eh, it's know. a coin toss. If if hipsterism wasn't sort of on the downswing in fashion, I'd say the dying prostitute is a good look for hipsters. But whip out a PBR and do your hair up like a dying prostitute, and you're good. Okay, wanting to steer the conversation away from dying prostitutes, we have animated feature film. Which we already discussed. We did? Yes. Oh, yeah, we did. Derp. Okay, well, I'm just trying to get away from the dying prostitute thing. <laughs> Please save us from the dying prostitutes. All Our right, so the never category thought it is best dying prostitute in a supporting role. <laughs> Pyro, go kill yourself. You win. Oh, but I have to become a prostitute first so that when I'm dying... I think he's implying that you are. <laughs> cinematography! We have cinematography here. Pixie, please read them off. So, the nominees for Best Cinematography were... Uh, Anna Karenina for Seamus McGarvey. I'm sorry, I'm butchering these names. <laughs> uh, Robert Richardson for Django Unchained. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I've got the first one backwards. My bad, can we tell it and see this one? <laughs> I don't even know what that one's about. So the nominee went to um, the movie was Anna Karenina. The person was Seema Garvey. Anywho, now that I uh, have totally butchered that and cannot say face at all, uh, moving on. Uh, another nomination for Lincoln went to Jancis Kaminsky, and another nomination for Skyfall went to Roger Dakins, the winner being Life of Pi, uh, Claudio Miranda. And if Life of Pi was going to win any awards, I'd be pretty happy that it would be cinematography. Although, well, Life of Pi nominally being a movie about the kid who is in a boat crash and is on a lifeboat with a tiger. And it's a big metaphor for finding God, and he follows Hinduism and Islam and Christianity all at the same time because he just wants to love God so much. It's like, okay, I think the redeeming thing about this story can be cinematography. That's okay by me. Okay, then. But other than that, he has no opinion. <laughs> I don't know what else to add on to that. I never saw the movie, either. Yeah, it was directed by the director of Hulk. 
to Ang Lee. You're still on about that, huh? I, You're still I have on scars about that, huh? from Hulk. It was a terrible oh. movie. Okay, yes, it was a terrible movie, but it just proves that Ang Lee shouldn't have been doing superhero movies. I suppose that's true. There are certain skill sets that don't apply to all types of movies. I mean, if, obviously you can you can do a good job of t telling a story about a boy on a boat with a tiger, but not do so great about radioactive green giant uh, getting very upset about things. And also a giant poodle, upset. so anyway. The Hulk is upset. Snake for understatement of the year. <laughs> I'm always upset. <laughs> In any case, we can just scooch over costume design because Anna Carthur... Karina? 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 Never saw that movie. No idea what it's about. Although the costumes did look pretty good with the posters I saw. So yay for that. Old timey pretty dresses. All very clean and shuddery and stuff. I also love the fact how the two Snow White movies got nominated for this also. It's right there next to each other. It's kind yep, of ironic. Go figure. In any case. So scooting on over to directing then? Yes, we're going to do that. I am I am steering us that way. I'm a reckless uh, driver. The winner was Ang Lee for Life of Pi. Uh, the other nominees were for uh, Beasts of hey, the Sun Hey, did you know Wild. that he actually directed Hulk also? <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I'm more like in it. So like, back Mountain. Playbook. I, I feel bad when Steven Spielberg loses to Mr. Brokeback Mountain and Hulk. <laughs> Mr. Brokeback Hulk. Yes, correct. Hulk wish Hulk could quit you! <laughs> <laughs> Joke okay. of the show right there, folks. Okay, you can just could... turn the podcast off now, because we've topped it. Okay, that could just end so many bad ways. But yes, yeah, Sp Sir Steven Spielberg losing out to anybody for directing feels a little weird. I'm sorry, I'm still, like, tickled over my own joke. <laughs> okay, keep going. You can keep, you can keep on. Hold on, I want to look up how many Oscars Steven Spielberg has. I feel like probably at this point they just don't give the Oscar to Steven Spielberg anymore, because they're like, you have <laughs> just enough. Just like, you have too many. I don't know You've got some. You've got so many, many that we needed to borrow you from you. have too many of them. Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan. That's it? He has two, two Oscars for directing? That's ridiculous. Okay, so, so maybe he's not as fabulous as we thought. Apparently, Pyrosim has also decided that two is officially too many. Two yes, is not so enough. I mean, E.T., do Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jurassic Park. Surely he should have some more than two Oscars. Well, he probably will have more Oscars in the future, and don't call me Shirley. Now, we have the next two categories are for documentary and documentary short. None of us you, saw I... any of those, so can I can I assume that none of us yeah. saw any of those documentaries? Yep. Although I will say the one that won for a short documentary, you know, Sente, it looked really impressive. That so, one I'd be interested in seeing. Documentary feature winner was Searching for Sugar Man. Moving on. Yes. We have nothing we to have... say about those. Film editing. They exist. This is this is this is the one that I'm super pumped about. This is the whole reason I wanted to do this show. Booyah! Uh, winner was film Argo. editing. Oh my gosh. Argo. To William Goldenberg. Argo. So, GG. Argo. GG. GG. That was a tight movie. Like, there was, was no so fat on that like, at all. I, <laughs> so I feel so left out in the world right now, having not seen and that like, movie. One of, the, one of the techniques that they had used for editing, oddly enough, took a while to grow on me. The um, bit where they were, and um, we talked about this when we reviewed the movie, uh, like, two months ago, <laughs> um, was that they took the, like, old footage from the actual time period, which is in a completely different aspect ratio, <laughs> and uh, it stuck that in interstitially with the, you know, film stuff for the movie. And that really what it did was it freaking highlighted how good the casting and costuming was, because dang. Um, but after a while, it totally, after, like, a little bit, I don't know, Pyro, would you say that you felt the same way that it took a while, or did you, like, just immediately love that? It was the fact that it was in 4.3 versus 16.9 that made me okay with it. Like, I, See, that was the I was part confused that was in, like, the me... first 20 seconds of seeing it. Yeah. But then I decided that, okay, I can I can distinguish between period piece and recreation. So See, it that was feel the thing like was it's... that it was feeling jerky to me when I first saw it because of the change in aspect ratio. Back and forth. And then after a while, I was like, this is actually really cool. But 
Because then you, they, like, sit there and you think to yourself, well, I was, like, just kind of mulling it over, like, this is totally, like, real. <laughs> like, it, it kind of hit they me do that a way. Montage. I was too young. I, was, I think Pyro and I are both too young for that to have been, like, a big cultural touchstone for us, the actual event, but... So this was just, like, I am watching a movie for, like, most of the way through until I got to those parts and I was like... And then I kind of sunk in that this is actually a thing. Somebody yeah. lived that. The Iranian hostage crisis wasn't a cultural touchstone for me, but just the visual design of the hair and the clothing just made me feel like a very young child because, yes, people did do their hair like that and dress like that. And it was a long time ago for me that that happened, but it is so authentic that it, it st stirs some powerful memories in me. They do a montage in the credits at the very end of real photos side by side with stills from the movie. And it is just distressing how accurately they recreated everything. And so, yeah, there there's an arc where you notice that they're mixing in the period footage. And then you decide that you're okay with it. And then by the end, you're just amazed at how accurate they are with it. I would have felt like it was maybe sort of cloying and inauthentic if they were trying to invisibly be blend the period footage like i don't know who are you to go pretend that this is a documentary i feel like that's sort of insincere to the actual suffering that happened but in order if you're saying that okay this is real and this is recreation and they're very distinct then it pays homage to the suffering rather than trivializing it and i'm okay with it yeah, I I think that was like kind of part of my turning point too, and it it just it was so well done. This is really good. They totally earned that editing Oscar. I will be taking your word on that until I see it in a week or so, or whenever I see it. I will see it, okay? <laughs> Shut up! I'll see it. Stop judging me. Uh, also nominated were Life of Pi, Lincoln, Silver Lanes Playbook, and Zero Dark Thirty. Bunch Apparently, of movies, the only movies know. that exist, according to the Academy. Seems like it's a relatively small list of movies in most of these categories. Foreign yeah, language they're... film, I don't think any of us have seen these, so we're just going to gloss that over. We all knew which one was going to win, the only one any of us had actually ever heard of. So, Amor? Yes. Um, makeup and hairstyling had yep. three nominations. Uh, Hitchcock, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, and Les Mis won that one. What a surprise. I don't know. I thought The Hobbit did really well for that. Although, admittedly, I know of some people that were, like, a little shocked considering, well, what is there to do in Les Mis? You tell your actors, go roll around that dirt for a while. Hugh Jackman, I'm going to get drunk and cut your hair. Okay, there, you're perfect. There, like Oscar. The singing is the most important part of Les Mis. you got to get the singing right, and nothing else counts. But apparently the hair and makeup counted. More than a bunch of... <laughs> hobbits. And dragons. The dwarves, I think, ooh, like, I don't know. I just think that the Hobbit put a lot of work into that. Also, do you have nice. any idea how long it took them to put that makeup on that dragon? <laughs> and, they're and, very, the color... and, the, and they're not very cooperative clients. They had to color coordinate every single scale. Do you have any idea how much blush that took? But I digress again. Uh, music. Uh, Life of Pi took that one. Uh, also nominated were Anna Karenina, Argo, Lincoln, and Skyfall. So, yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, having not seen Life of Pi, I can't really give any testament to that. I liked I've read the book. Skyfall. I liked the sound in it, but... I could say I've read the book for for Life of Pi, although I don't know how great the music was. <laughs> the book was rather quiet. Man, this book has great music. Wait a minute, I'm listening to Maroon 5. <laughs> this book has great music. <laughs> there you go. Was it a good book? Oh, it's a great book. It's a fabulous book. It takes a while. Interesting to hear. It's a bit of a slow read, I have to admit, but it is well worth it. The entire story. I feel like such a slacker because, like, while you're waiting for things to render, you read. I could go watch dumb videos on the internet. Well, I do that too sometimes, but. <laughs> Snake is all defensive. He's like, I watch dumb internet videos too. <laughs> I waste my time also. I don't always try to enrich my brain by reading words on paper. <laughs> Clearly, I need to put more comics in your life, right? In any case, next one after that is music, Best an original, original song. song. Yes. Skyfall from Skyfall. 
a down. I, I agree with this. I love this. And the opening sequence for it, like, visually was also really cool, too. But Also, they kind of cheated because they, were, because they had Adele sing it. She also wrote the lyrics, but, you know. I know, but they had Adele <laughs> sing it at the Oscars, so I think everyone was already biased for it. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Oh, yeah, it was. Also, how cool was it they actually got to have Goldfinger sung, too? You did hear that, didn't you? I was not aware of that, and I may have to look it up, because that sounds fantastic. Oh, I dear God. I missed it. Oh, good. I, <clears throat> hang on a second. I need to remember who sang it. Who sang the theme of Goldfinger? I'm sure uh, I'll get linked that later. And then through the magic of editing, you'll miss this truly riveting segment where Nerd Talk searches the internet. <laughs> Shirley Bassey, or Basie. Shirley Basie. That name sounds familiar, though. Um, yes, well, she was there at the Oscars, and she actually sang Goldfinger. She still Goldfinger. had her voice? She still had her voice. I was surprised, too. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, did you said that, and then immediately I thought back to when I went to OzFest, Ozzy did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Somebody. no surprise right there. Somebody was like, old age did not treat Ozzy well. And I was like, no, drugs did not treat Ozzy well. Yeah, true enough, but... There exists some published Tom Jones album where Tom Jones redid all of his number one hits while he was, like, 70 years old and did not have it anymore. And I have distinct memories of my dad purchasing this album and putting it in and then pulling it out and then snapping the CD in half because it was really bad. Like, this was not actually Tom Jones. Sure, he was singing, but he didn't have his voice anymore. I don't even know why a label would publish this. Yeah, well, it, yeah, but Shirley Bassey, she's 76. 76, and she sang one of the songs that she's best known for. Yeah. She sang... That she song did a great is job. super soulful and deep, and you have to be powerful in order to sing that song, so that's super impressive. I mean, you can tell that she obviously obviously age is caught up with her, but still, the fact that she was able to put out that much and project and still be able to keep up with the lyrics, it was amazing. It's her most iconic of the three Bond songs she's ever sung. She sung Goldfinger, Diamonds Are Forever, and Moonraker. Obviously, Goldfinger the one, is the one she's best known for. It's become iconic in the Bond universe, but still... And she got a standing ovation, obviously. Ironically, Moonraker is the movie Featuring amongst those that means Snake's the most cat. to me. <laughs> Wait, what? I, I heard the cat. <laughs> oh, yes, the cat, too. Moonraker is the movie amongst those that has the most significance for me because I liked using the laser gun in GoldenEye 64. Uh-huh. Laser gun! But also That game was so good. Oh, yes, no doubt about that. Totally still, won't have held up it was great years, but still. It was great hearing Sky. It was great that Skyfall won Best mu Original Song, and it was great that we got to hear Goldfinger at the Oscars. That was, it was a good night to be a James Bond fan. And by we, we clearly just mean Snake because he was the only one to watch it. Well, yeah, apparently. Good grief, you guys. I went to bed. You know this. Oh, curse you! Trying to be all restful and productive the next day. I didn't I even watch school. the PlayStation event. If I'm going to watch one of two things, I'm going to miss the Oscars, see the PlayStation event. That didn't pan out too well. You had one job to do. And that job was my actual job, where I earn money. And also and you have, to school like, three jobs, to be, to be fair. Or in any case, let's we'll get Not to the PlayStation stuff really, a later. Really, that's two jobs. Let's move on with this stuff right now. Pixie? <laughs> two! Can anyone mm. actually hear me? Nope. Pixie there? Uh, am I? You're, you're there. Pyro, not so much. Alright, I guess we'll twiddle our thumbs for a minute while he reconnects. Four seconds, come on. Now, oh, this is frustrating. <sighs> it doesn't usually connect the disconnect two of us. Usually oh, hey, the call decided food. to come back. Anyhow. So, yeah. So, moving on. Production design. Oh, wait, you're going to deal with the cat thing? Okay, I guess I'll wait. I already did, I already did. Okay. okay. Keep going. Uh, so, production design. What does production design mean, anyway? Basically means all of the stuff in a movie. Uh, oh, that nails it down. 
I was thinking like maybe it's setting or like maybe it sets, but why wouldn't they just say that? So I don't know. Set design or something like that. I think mm-hmm. that's probably what it is, more or less. Yeah, but I guess then in digital things, then. Well, then why would Life of Pi be up for a nomination anyway? Since well, all oh, the time computer. Oh, because there's there's like yeah, there's there's one is for set decoration, the other is for production design, and it's the same award, but two people accept it for those two things respectively. So I don't know. But anyway, Lincoln won this one. So hooray! Good for them. They made it look like... I don't know. I would have probably given it to The Hobbit. Yeah, but then again, they just cheat and just use New Zealand. They just... So? They don't have to... Well, they don't have to use... They don't have to make any sets. They don't have to make things look like Middle Earth. They just Oh, what about that Middle volcano Earth. scene? The volcano scene? Like the, the mountain thing. How do you know it's not New Zealand? Maybe it's a tourist attraction. Uh, the special effects do. Plus, I think they should get a lot of credit for... Dressing Andy Circus up like that dragon and putting all that makeup on him. That's impressive. There's, a, there's that, too. <laughs> they even had John Goodman make a cameo as the Troll King. But I digress again. <sighs> Dear Best short film animated. Andy Circus was not the dragon. Uh, clearly, the only thing that we need to take away from this is that Paper Man one, which was awesome. Yes, Yay, it was Paper awesome. Man. But it I find was so cute. That- I find it impressive that a Simpsons short actually got made onto this list. The creators of The Simpsons are still alive? Well, no, I'm amazed that they actually got something into the Oscars. <laughs> but yes, Paper Man is absolutely adorable. It's so cute. Also, it's I checked coming it. from somebody who hates rom coms, it's saying something. Also, it's uh, apparently a nice mix of hand drawn and digital art, and it really showed. And it, the, the, the art style totally, like, reminded me of Hercules, which, you know, probably helped. Also go figure the woman's movie. name. Also go figure the woman's name was Meg, or Mag, I forget which. But close enough, anyway. It had amazing comedic timing, and that will win me over to anything. Also, I love, love any story that can be told without any words. I love anything that's just going through the visuals and the music. Mm-hmm. So, like, plop you down in front of, like, a silent film marathon and you were a happy camper? Mm. Ironically, silent films often use many words in their storytelling. They just use them in title cards. Okay, let me make an addendment. What I mean is animated ones I can tell without talking. What's well, actual people that's different. Mm. I don't know what it is. People suck! Okay. <laughs> no, can we edit that out? Snake is just a raging misanthropist. Nope. No, I'm, I'm just not. sticking it in. I'm just repeating it. I'm gonna I'm gonna copy that and loop it and put it elsewhere in the show. Just make you seem like you're really hateful. Oh, thanks for that one there, Pyro. Despite the fact that he's like, you know, a total sweetheart and adorbs. Anyhow. Short film, uh, live action. Best live action short film. Live action. Winner was live. curfew. I don't think I saw any of these. Well it was past your curfew. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that funny? <laughs> but thank you. Okay, okay, you've won yourself back. Maybe I'm I, sure maybe no I told that joke. maliciously edit the show to make you sound oh like God. a monster. For sound yeah, editing, we had a again. tie, which I didn't know was a thing that you could do. Uh, oh, bless it. Oi, there it goes again. And we're back. Quick, Uh, let's hurry up with sound editing before it cuts again. Sound editing uh, resulted in a tie, which I'm not sure was a thing that you could do. Yeah, Uh, I never knew you could actually do that. The winners were for both Skyfall and Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, The other three nominees being Life of Pi, Django Unchained, and Argo. Did they just pull a Judgment of Solomon with the statue and just cut it in half? That would have been weird, but no. Kind of be like, hey, I want to take a statue home. I won, so you got to give me something. I they imagine they statues. Just, yeah, <laughs> they, they, they just, just make more statues. More statues. Of Feels course like that it. makes it less special. And they had them both except one at a time. They each had their turn. And by the way, the fun thing is, whenever the playoff music for the Oscars the was way, the jaw was the Jaws theme. Oh. So whenever you were taking too long, you would have a shark coming up toward you. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Mixed well, in with this one, one time, but it was keyboard it. cat. Hmm. Sorry, Pixie, you were saying something? Uh, nothing. I think my audio just cut out. Oh, okay. 
And best sound mixing, which is somehow different from sound editing. Yeah, I don't know how. I don't really know how to distinguish. I thought the that two. one was part of the other. <laughs> Could just sworn that mixing was just this aspect of editing, but what to lame is. I guess they had to give it something for the singing. For the fact that they were doing something so ridiculously different for the audio. Also nominated so, were Life of Pi, Argo, Lincoln, and Skyfall. Do they just have Argo nominated for everything? Pretty much. Best animated short, Argo. <laughs> hey now. <laughs> I can support that. Most handsome Ben Affleck. The Oscar <laughs> goes to Alan Arkin for Argo. What? <laughs> Uh, I'm just saying that was a pretty handsome beard. Oh man! If you say so. Oh, no. Perfect ben beard. Affleck. Should, I, should I just leave I'm, you two I'm alone? I'm referring to Affleck, but anyhow. You two, you two want to get out your pictures of Affleck, and I'll just leave the room for a little while. I'd like the so audience to please here. disregard that I'm currently growing my facial hair exactly the way Ben Affleck has it. I'm just gonna stick to that style for a while. So you can have a ginger Ben Affleck look. Yep. A ginger Affleck. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Moving onwards and downwards. Best visual effects. Uh, Life of Pi. Okay, now this, this one took so many awards and I didn't watch it. Okay, I this one, this like one, ugh. the visual effects. I don't really have so much of a problem of Life of Pi getting the award. It was the announcing of the award that kind of bugged me. This was when they brought out the five people from Avengers that they because had. Because the yeah, the other nominees were the Hobbit, Avengers, Prometheus, and Snow White and the Huntsman. Now I've seen I've seen three of those movies, all of which have fantastic visuals. But what kind of irked me was the fact they had Samuel L. Jackson, um, Hawkeye, Hulk, who's who they uh, probably Jeremy have real Renner names. Jeremy plays okay. um, Hawkeye. Mark okay. Ruffalo is Hulk. Okay, there you go. Those two, uh, RDJ and um, what else do they have? They had someone else out there too, but I forget. But they had five members of the Avengers out there. They had I'm all these guys up there. And the Can shtick, I just throw names out there until maybe I hit one? <laughs> but they had all these guys out there, and just nothing happened. And Chris Evans, I think he was out there too, but nothing really happened. They started talking for a while, and it was really awkward, and they made fun of Samuel for being old, and then they just and gave they the award. they pull a lever, and trap doors open up underneath each of those people, and they drop into Basically. a pit, and then the announcer yells, You lose! You get nothing! Good day, sir! That's kind of what it felt like. I mean... It's like they were setting up for something really funny, and then they just died. It was embarrassing, really. All right, Daniel. Also, have... Since we brought you on as the voices guy, can you give me a Willy Wonka? Do you mm. have one? For what? For which one? You lose. You get nothing. Good day, sir. Oh, I've never really tried the that original. before. The original. Original <laughs> one. It's all there, Chris. I'll it's all out, there, black and white, clear as crystal. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped Gene into Wilder. the wall that must be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. I've never tried doing Willy Wonka before. I think I get went. I think went British at the end there. Staring at Chris Evans for a little bit. I can't do his voice very well. In any case, right. it just it just kind of ticked me off. The whole Avengers thing, having the Avengers there, and and really everyone in the audience, all the ladies were thinking, "Where's Chris Hemsworth?" And all the guys were thinking, "Where's Scarlett Johansson?" So everyone was just disappointed. I've, and I'm then the, Pixie and I are disappointed twice. Well, there you go. We had no Hemsworth, and we had no Scarlett Johansson. It was a sad day for everybody. Uh, moving on to best writing for an adapted screenplay. Uh, Let's all guess. Well, the nominees were uh, Beasts of the Southern Wild, Life of Pi, Lincoln, Silver Linings Playbook, and Argo. Which would you like to guess? Mm, Wreck-It Ralph. I will take best picture for a thousand, Alex. It was Argo. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Surprise>. <laughs> I was close. Ding, 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 ding. Eh, no, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Argo is a really Argo. good movie. I'm between, Ar uh, between Argo and Lincoln, and I'd, I'd probably give it to Argo. I am pleased by the this category and the next category, because there's two movies that I both liked at very similar levels, and then they both just get to win. I get to be happy. For writing. Best writing for an writing. original screenplay. The nominees were Amora, Flight, Moonrise Kingdom, Zero Dark Thirty, and our winner, Django Unchained. Booyah. Woo. Well, Django so. Unchained and Argo both get the writing winnings. Yay, Quentin Tarantino. They get a Tarantino's million dollars. And or a dumb statue that they can just make more of. That really, that really upsets you, doesn't it? 
they could just make more of the statues. Yeah, they gotta be, like, plated in platinum and worth a lot of money because of their physical construction. And blessed by the Pope. Anyway. They were a ser- so, I guess that's the Oscars for 2013. Well, they were- well, there probably were some other nominations, but nothing enough to get on the on ABC's website, at least. Or the Oscar website, so I'm pretty sure that's it. In any case, what this will all be known for in the end is this was the this night the that Jennifer... This is the year Jennifer... that uh, Argo won everything, pretty much. Well, I was going to say this was the year that Jennifer Lawrence tripped when she went out to get her Oscar, but yes. I don't <laughs> think anybody's going to remember that. I think everybody's going to remember that. And Have if they don't, I will make sure society, they will. society, if that's the way that goes down. If, the, if, to be fair, though, she got a standing ovation when she got up. <laughs> and then she said, you're all just standing up because I fell now. And so she was even more embarrassed. <laughs> it was all a sham all along. She just wanted the standing ovation, and she was making the play to get it. Well, it worked. Congratulations. So, yes, all around it was great. But um, aside from the Oscars, why don't we talk about the host? Seth MacFarlane is a surprisingly classy dude. This I did not expect that from the guy who made Ted. Or Family Guy. But Pretty admittedly, much. Seth did basically admit right out there he was in front of a bunch of people that made such wonderful works of art, and he made Ted. And for the record, Ted did get to announce a winner for one of the, for one of the Oscars. I forget which one. It was like sound editing or something. And, uh... Yeah, no, it was surprisingly tasteful. He kind of, like, took the mickey out of himself, but... It did seem like they prob- the committee probably had to make sure he promised to be on better behavior than normally we get from Seth MacFarlane, but yes, he did a surprisingly good job at being genuinely funny and not just shocking. It's sort of an impressive choice for the host. I would figure they would tend to go conservative, like, after the nip slip at the uh, Super Bowl halftime show... Uh, who was that? The Super Bowl halftime show? Janet Jackson, you're bringing up that? But after after that happened, the Super Bowl halftime show committee just went, like, super, super conservative, and we had like, years and years of the Rolling Stones and super old white men. Uh, it's I feel like the Oscars hosting has kind of been boring conservative choices, and because Seth MacFarlane is a, a super offensive dude, and so... It is cool that they would choose him. Well, to be fair, he never had a wardrobe malfunction while on stage, so there you go. But he did have some weird uh, one-on-one action with uh, talking with uh, William Shatner, of all people. Which I was not expecting. At the beginning, they do an entire shtick with him talking to William Shatner as Captain Kirk. And then a whole bunch of craziness happens. He does a song about... Seeing boobs, he does a reenactment of flight using sock puppets. Um, then what else? Then what else? Does a dance with Harry Potter and the guy from Inception and Robin. Uh, do, do you mean Daniel Radcliffe? Because he's not actually Harry Potter. I hate to break that to you. I know, I know. I, I, I don't know the names. Okay. He is actually a wizard. He's just not Harry Potter. <sighs> I'm just saying, he did a dance number with Seth MacFarlane and that guy that was in the Inception in The Dark Knight Rises, who probably has a real name, but I don't know what it is. <clears throat> they did a dance number. It was funny and charming. I'm trying to think of anything else crazy happening. Not no, sure. Seth, Seth did a really great job. He had some clever segues every time they were going from a bit or to each Oscar. When Meryl Streep came out to uh, give away the award for Best Actor... He, the whole the whole introduction of her was, ladies and gentlemen, our next our next host does ne- needs no introduction and just walks off stage. <laughs> Literally, that was it. He walks off stage and Meryl Streep comes out. It was hilarious. Imagine that joke playing as the next host needs no introduction and then he walks off stage and then just nobody comes up for like five minutes. That would have been super awesome. Although. Meryl Streep, you said? Yeah, Meryl Streep. That's impressive. That's exciting. Yes, well, anyway, Seth MacFarlane also had a really funny shtick when he was introducing Christopher Plummer. He was mentioning how Christopher Plummer was best known as his role in Sound of Music as the leader of the Von Trapp family singers. And they said, let's welcome on stage. And the spotlight goes over to a door. And they all applaud. And the music plays. And then nothing. 
And he says, the Von Trapp family, and they do that again. And then the guy runs in through the door in a Nazi costume saying, they've gone. So they do the whole sound of music shtick. It was funny. And then they follow it with springtime for Hitler. Unfortunately, no. Dang it. But he did have a song about boobs. You need to look it up. I suppose that, like, one quarter compensates for no the producers. I guess. I I like boobs a lot, but I really like the producers. (laughs) Seriously, though, he did a Seriously, though, he did a song mentioning when different actresses had shown their boobs in different movies. It was called We Saw Your Boobs. <laughs> and then also there was that time that Daniel Radcliffe was naked in Equus. I guess there's that too. In which case, we saw his Johnson. <laughs> I don't know that that works quite okay. as well for a song. I want to go on a deep, deep, deep tangent here and just tell our listeners... That there is a standardized test in high schools in New Mexico named the Woodcock Johnson exam, and that is the most hilarious thing in the world. Even better than Intercourse Pennsylvania? It's it's a test that is named after dicks three times in a row. It's just, it's just, it's just over and over and over. It's amazing. And whoever passes gets a wonder boner. (laughs) And a slippery banana. Right, Pixie? The rest of that was fine, just uh, just that one bit. Uh, making editing notes. Do do do. Wonder boner. So it sounds like the Oscars are worth looking up on YouTube for the purposes of the musical events. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to take, they were they did nods to so many different musicals, including Chicago. Where, if I may borrow from Nostalgia Quick for a moment, we get to see Catherine Zeta-Jones in her in her outfit from Chicago, and boy, can she still rock it. I thought you were going to say we saw her boobs, and I was like, I don't remember that in Chicago. <laughs> it was in the director's cut, but... Um, <clears throat> Hold on, I gotta go to Amazon.com. <laughs> and of course, since they had the entire cast of Les Mis, they had to do, they had to do, a, tri- they had to do a song from there, too. So you get Hugh Jackman and Anne Hathaway and all and everyone else on stage singing One More Day. It was quite awesome. All right, then. I wasn't interested in actually tuning into the Oscars at all, but now that you tell me there's so many musical features, I might have to look them up. So shame on you, sir. <laughs> I missed them because I was sleeping like an old person. Well, shame on you, madam. Well, yeah, and Seth MacFarlane made a joke about that, too. Saying how since we're going this long, we'll just be showing the next, next Oscars while we're at it, too. Just roll right into the 24, 2013s. Exactly. I mean, dear God, how long is that thing going to last? Are Notable omission. The... No Cloud Atlas anywhere on anything. I, I even controlled f it so that I didn't miss it like I did with Wreck-It Ralph. Don't you control F me, young man. Control F whoever I please. I don't know where to go after that. Hey, now, that kind of control Fing is generally reserved for two people in a committed relationship or multiple people who are just having a really awesome Saturday night. As long as it is controlled effing. No, there's there's control effing and obey effing. It's like it's the two roles that you play. <laughs> oh, Callie. Going... Okay, so where was the line that we Catholic passed? Catholic Station Radio. <laughs> It'll play real well at the demographic for this university. Oddly enough, it's still all radio safe, technically. It's all just innuendo. Innuendo. <laughs> if, if I didn't have to be so quiet because everyone else was asleep, I'd be trying to add in more laughs to this, but I can't. Yeah, sorry we got such a late start on that, huh? No, it's okay. All right. I that's, think one that, uh, why, that's one of the reasons why I can't do voices. Usually sure, I have sure. to be able to be louder. Yeah, yeah, no. And again, no they, and you can't really do voices when you're whispering. Yeah, no, Definitely. no Totes. Anywho. This should about who, do our coverage for the Oscars before our coverage goes longer than the actual Oscars and only one of us watched them and none of us saw many of the movies. So yeah, aren't we committed journalists? Yeah, journalism. We're just busy people, generally. Cannot wait to make this my full-time gig. Anywho. <laughs> and what? now we're back. Thank you for that, Snake. <laughs> My so, pleasure. another thing that happened since our last show, the PlayStation event, uh, the announcement of the PlayStation 4 and all of the games and stuff that are going to be up for that. So, Still I must no- say, one of the first things that I'm tremendously excited is that they actually 
well, A, announced a name for the dang thing because there was speculation before that they were going to say, we're going to have a next generation console and we're going to name it NGC until we announce the actual name because we totally did this with the Vita and we're Sony and we're crazy people. And then maybe even once we announce the name, it'll be the Orbis or something dumb. And the PlayStation is like the only video game console that has a decent name. Like obviously the Wii and the Wii U have super dumb names, but when you think about the Xbox, the Xbox also kind of has a bit of a dumb name. I mean, it's super cool and it's a great console so we forgive it, but the Xbox? What does that even mean? <laughs> Especially since it stands for, well it came from Direct X, which was Direct Expert, so it's the Expert Box. <laughs> well, it's just one massive innuendo now. Amongst the... <laughs> For your old girlfriend. <laughs> I'll just kill myself now. Amongst the consoles that have ever existed, I would say the PlayStation and the Nintendo Entertainment System alone have had names that are like, okay, this is actually a name that sounds cool and describes what this is. The PlayStation has that, and I was super afraid that they would give it up, but they didn't. Were you afraid they were just called... Bob? I was afraid they would call it the Orbis, honestly, since that was the code name in development. What's wrong with Orbis? It's super dumb. I, I guess it does sound like I guess it, it does sound like a disease of some sort. It has less in common with Woodcock Johnson than the the Wii does, but it's still pretty dumb. Penis. There, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. What they did give up was the start and select buttons on the controller. That is Are they no more. Mad? How Which am I is... supposed to pause things? There is no pausing. You play forever. You use their what share of I the internet function to get a friend to take over your game and play for you while you go to the bathroom. This assumes that everyone that has a PlayStation has a friend. Sorry, oh. that was mean. <laughs> Super sad. I'm sorry, but think about it. Most of the time, don't. Especially in PlayStation 2, weren't most of their games just one player? Yeah, the PlayStation 2 didn't have a network connection by default. There was an adapter peripheral that you could buy, but very few games had any support for it. Well, that's kind of just because the seventh generation of consoles is the first one to actually have the internet, and even then, not really for their full lifespan. Like, Xbox Live it was obviously the superior internet platform of the two, but it got added in after the Xbox was already well out and full swing and people were using it so i'm they announced a lot of internet features at this event most interestingly there was the one about like moving a save state of your game to somebody else's playstation so they can play from right where you left off across the internet like pass and play multiplayer built into any game for non-local friends no, so, never let me said PlayStation doesn't come up with confusing concepts. <laughs> it's super weird. Although, they made... The PlayStation 2 had a super weird CPU in the Emotion Engine, and then they followed it up with another super weird CPU in the Cell. The PlayStation 3 is literally a PC. Like, they announced on the stage that, yeah, we use souped-up PC hardware inside the PlayStation 3. It is an x86 processor and an NVIDIA graphics chip. Hmm. Maybe they decided that it was super difficult for developers to develop for all the crazy hardware they put in the PlayStation 3, and they wanted it to make it easier next time so that they wouldn't wind up thrown under the bus the way they did this generation. Fair enough, then. In the place of the start and select buttons is a capacitive touchpad. I believe, Which Pixie, you had something to say about this. Uh, uh... I'm noticing a, a trend here that I'm not super thrilled with in consoles announced and released in this particular time space. There's a lot of friggin' touchscreens. Wii U, giant touchpad. Not to mention, like, all the, like, app-based games that you see on things like the iPad and other tablets. Or smartphones. And those are understandable, because those are ostensibly for adults, but, like, does nobody remember, like, and I'm going to sound like a back-in-my-day kind of thing, but... Oh, please do. You know, you unwrap that N64 for Christmas or something like that. That's a thing. Like, people go out and they get the video game console for children. And I'm not saying that video games by necessity need to be toys or marketed to kids, but 
somebody's going to want to use them in that way. I, I feel like they're missing part of the point, or they're at the very least missing out on a lot of money by excluding that particular demographic this way. Either that or they're just going to expect a lot of these things to break, because really, kids and touchscreens... The, the freaking Wii nunchuck caused people to throw things into their TVs, like, and that had a wrist strap on it. I don't know how you expect a capacitive touchscreen on a controller, what is it, approximately the size of the 6-axis? Uh, yeah, it? it's, it's basically the same proportions as every previous PlayStation controller. Maybe a little fatter uh, around the midsection, but width and height-wise, it is the same size. Yeah, I don't know. That just that just screams begging to be broken. And it also doesn't help, too, that that's going to drive the price point way up. And we still don't know how much this thing's going to cost, but that certainly is going to hurt. Well, we all know it's going to go down as the most expensive console in history. Uh, that may or may not be true. I would not be surprised. Okay, this is going to be expensive for them to manufacture. And Okay, they didn't announce a price point, but I'm going to say right now... A premium model is four ninety nine or five forty nine, and the discount really? model. I'm I'm gonna expect it to be way higher than that, like pushing a, like. Almost either it's four gonna digits. be pushing, yeah, it's either gonna be pushing a thousand or they're gonna be missing a lot of stuff out of the box. No, nope, I bet they're gonna take a huge loss on it out of the gate. Is what I think they're gonna do. Oh, you think you think Sony is gonna be nice about this, hmm? Sony took a huge loss on the PS3 out of the gate and, and priced it at and, five. And, yeah, Good point. And, and hint, the PS3 was still really damn expensive. It sure was, but one of the merits That's of what they're doing is that they're using commodity hardware for this. It has PC components in it, and so the cell processor was this super weird thing that they had to build chip manufacturing process plants for because it was unlike anything that had ever existed. But this has an x86 CPU, just like is in every computer that we're doing this Skype call in. And so, rather than having to build new assembly lines, you just you just buy them off the shelf. And so, I, I think because of that decision, they're going to be less expensive commodity prices, and taking the same magnitude of a loss that they took on the PS3, they're going to wind up at the same price point that they wound up at the PS3, or maybe like $50 lower. Yeah, well, part of the... Expense was one of the reasons why I never got PC PS3 in the first place. But... Exactly, and I still don't. It's one of the reasons and... that nobody got a PS3, really. It's probably why it was the non-dominant console in the generation. Well, hopefully Sony will remember that. Which is funny, because most people in my social circle, you two excluded, have one, and basically bought one to use as a Blu-ray player. Well, that was the other thing that they did smart. That was, kind of, that was probably the main thing that saved the PS3 in the first place, was the fact that it included something that wasn't just a game player, but also something to use for, well, what was becoming this new thing now in entertainment, too. Because having a game console that's just a game console doesn't work anymore. It has to be, well, multi-purpose. It has to be the Swiss Army knife of uh, gadgets. The it Xbox to... managed to be a fair bit cheaper than the PlayStation 3 at launch because Blu-ray was also such a new format and you had to build new manufacturing plants for it, uh, and the the Xbox used off-the-shelf DVDs, but the Xbox isn't going to have that advantage anymore because developers want way more capacity for their games than you can put on a DVD. Mm -hmm. Especially with this new processing power, you're going to be rendering 1080 video, and you're going to need bigger textures in order to make that look decent. So, do we know what this is going to be run? What the next wave of consoles is going to be running? I f I kind of expected it to just go straight to like all download stuff. Uh, if for no reason than to spite the used sales market. There was no particular announcement about the disc format, but it seems that it does have discs, and I am almost 100% certain that it will be Blu-rays again for the PlayStation 4. Just straight-up Blu-rays. Uh, it'll have hard drives by default, and downloads will be a big component of it. Uh, there will be day-and-date $60 releases over the PlayStation Network. But there will still be discs, and there will still be offline play. Well, that was a huge factor of speculation, that there would be no offline play, and that appears to be unfounded. Hey everybody, it's me from the future. Sen's gonna show up. I know we said he wasn't gonna show up earlier in the show, but now he's here, so don't freak out. 
Now, one other feature that I was really excited to see was the, like, integrated sharing stuff, because one excuse that we've had for a long time on why we didn't do more Let's Play features on our site was, you know, trying to get the tech to work for the current generation of consoles. And having that capturing and broadcasting capability built right in is going to be a godsend. Now, this I'm curious about, because it appears that they're building in a video encoder... So theoretically, they can record and stream any part of the console, any game, and all of the interface. Just no matter what, no extra work needed by the developers. But I'm skeptical that they're actually going to make that functionality available everywhere. Because developers don't necessarily like Let's Plays all the time. Uh, some of them take the tact that people are going to watch videos instead of actually playing their games. Which is... Which does happen... Partially true and partially not true. Like, I mean, video games have as one of their strongest assets their interactive components. And I tend to listen to Let's Plays as podcasts, often not even watching the video component of it. And video is obviously another important aspect of video games. I just... It's right there in the name. Like... <laughs> so it is. I like the part of Let's Plays where there's an excuse for a person to just talk, and I like the parts of Let's Plays where they're talking about things that are not the video games, so but simultaneously... So basically, I'll... you just like podcasts with a video game in the background. Yes, like, that is significantly true. Like, sometimes the video game plays more of a role, sometimes it plays less. Like, they can be talking about the development or design aspects of the video game, and that can be an interesting kernel of their conversation. Or, in the case of some... The ones I tend to prefer, they're just talking about totally unrelated stuff. And it gives them a bit of freedom to not have to try and have really pertinent, interesting stuff. Because the audience maybe is coming for the video game. And because they have that freedom, they tend to talk their minds a little more. I like just getting inside people's heads. Uh, but also... If I'm watching a Let's Play instead of playing a video game, it's because I don't have time to be playing a video game. And if I am if I don't have time to be playing a video game, it's because I'm driving a car. So, I, I watch Let's Plays with my ears while driving cars. It's not preventing me from buying any video games. Okay, so what we're basically saying is that all these Let's Plays are not going to drive down video game sales because Pyro watches games with his ears. <laughs> Correct. And that's what it all comes down to. Well, and it also might help spark interest in games that, like, people otherwise might not have heard of or tried. Uh, Trailers because... will only tell you so much. Yeah, I've got an online series that I follow that specifically is, like, three to four people sitting on a couch playing a game that I absolutely adore. And typically I will watch it if I have interest in a game that I don't didn't want to run out and buy. If it looks like they're having fun, I will assume I'm going to have fun. Most recently, I purchased Mark of the Ninja because of watching a Let's Play. Uh, but regardless of the actuality, it's probably true that some people uh, stop buying video games in part because of Let's Plays. And, and some it people stop some buying sales. video games because of piracy, but that doesn't mean DRM like that's super intrusive is going to be like... That, that's not exactly something that I can get on the cheer squad for. Absolutely. I mean, make no mistake, I'm in favor of having this feature available everywhere. Uh, but regardless yeah, of, of the reality of how Let's Plays so. affect sales, some <laughs> publishers are afraid of it. And afraid enough that I bet there's going to be restrictions on when this recording and streaming functionality is going to be available. Although kudos to them for doing this in the first place, because it means that you know, they could either be putting more regulations on recording or try and make it harder... Which means that people, are, but people are gonna still do it anyway, or they could just put it out there and let people do it in the way. Well, but look at it this way: if a game has nothing to hide as far as sales, if they know it's of high quality and that people are going to want it, streaming is only going to help your sales of that game because people are going to yeah, see it and be like, "I want to play basically this." Basically, free ads. Yeah, pretty much. That's that word of mouth thing that t generally tends to be the most valuable kind of advertising. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. The most prominent use case I imagine for this feature, and the place where that I know it'll be available, regardless of the publisher's views on DRM and such, is, like, Call of Duty multiplayer. 
Like, the people who are going to be posting their no-scope headshots are probably the target audience for this. But, yeah, people already post that, so there's... You're, you can only help the market by incorporating these features. The only downside is what's going to happen is we're going to be... F- is the internet's going to be even more flooded now with images of people, well, teabagging each other. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, there's On the other hand, this might, you know, help sites like uh, the Not in the Kitchen Anymore blog, which, by the way, I can't recommend highly enough. Oh, yeah. Is that, uh, true, true, true. Basically, there's good and evils and... And Jenny Hanover is awesome. There's the, Yeah. That's the whole point we're getting across here. I'll take a, a little side tangent. Pixie, have you seen the most recent Penny Arcade? Uh, no, actually. You should go read it. And the news what, post, right and now? all of us, and we'll come back to this. I'll cut this out. Okay, all I think right. we're all taking a break then, because Penny Arcade is on my list of comics I read. I have been playing League of Legends so, so wrong. Then deal damage to enemies using their unique skills. I'm going to sit here and eat my tomato basil cheese bomb with sriracha. Was there nobody in the entire restaurant, Jeff? No, it was just dead tonight. Uh, Everyone's kind of, like, afraid of the giant snowstorm we're supposedly getting at, you know, 2 in the morning. Yeah, we're getting it around 10 or so over here. Yep. Proving that storms travel at about 70 miles an hour. (laughs) The storm is just going to hop in a sedan and drive down the interstate to get to Bloomington. Which Bloomington? Either. Although I don't think you go through Bloomington, Indiana to get to Bloomington, Illinois. I was I was making a joke, but sure. Oh, anyway, true story. Mike Krahulik was rage quit all because of assholes. Because of realizing there's more than just, you know, it's a game and you should enjoy the game. Uh, alongside this one, have you seen... Oh, well, it's fine, because I rage quit uh, online gaming altogether for, like, almost a decade because of assholes, so... Yep. I remember you going to mention the China Open's unofficial League of Legends restaurant. We talked about it last I week. I haven't heard of this. Okay. Because we totally was... talked about it last week. We did. Well, I'm very late in finding this stuff, I know, but... You were there! I was. On last week's show, yes. I don't remember a League of Legends restaurant ever being brought up. Totally was. Briefly, but anyhow. So are we getting back to whatever we were talking about now? So maybe the fact that you're accountable for your actions in online multiplayer will have a discouraging effect on being an asshole, like... Internet jerk mod theory? Yeah, it is the anonymity component of the gift that makes all of the jerkiness possible. And so maybe the streaming will lead to a more friendly online multiplayer scene. While we're dreaming here, De- Jeff, I would also like to think that I will sprout wings and fly to the moon. But yes, I can see where you're coming from. I'm Dylan. <laughs> what I call you? Jeff. I'm eating pizza. Oh. <laughs> also looking at this and have begun drooling. Yes. For, well, those, okay. for those not playing with our internet connections, I've located the Street Fighter X Sanrio arcade fight stick. Which features Hello Kitty Street Fighter characters. For when you need blood and cuteness all in the same thing. You know, I think no I... No blood on the fighting stick, just on the screen. I think I'd get serious article? credit if I bring a pink fight stick to the arcade. Was there an article way back when about someone that got shot by a Hello Kitty handgun? Wait, <laughs> that's a thing? Yeah, someone actually had a I don't girl... think it was specifically Hello Kitty, I think it was just pink. No, it had Hello Kitty on it. Was it? Uh, yeah. Oh, nice. Child There's... thought it was a child thought it was a toy and shot somebody by mistake. New Hello Kitty firearms. Yeah, literally. The fight stick has Sanrio characters dressed up as Street Fight Fighter characters, and it's kind of super cute. Again, I would totally bring that to an arcade. Oh, I just want to play a Sanrio fighting game now. Did you oh, hear you that go. the main six fighting game got shut down? Wait, this, a, this is a surprise. Uh, th- I can't understand why they put so much work into it, because no, it's not a surprise. It's like, and 
Hasbro the... is so protective of its IP, are you kidding? Hasbro kind of didn't even have a choice about it because of the way that trademark laws work in the United States is if you don't protect your brand identity, then you lose your ability to protect your brand identity in future situations. So even if they approved of the main six fighting game, they cannot really allow it to exist using their trade dress without losing the ability to protect themselves from future things like it. So... Uh, I feel bad for the developers, but this was totally expected. Right. The the moment you let that kind of thing go through, you're opening the gate to any other fan project that could possibly come up. And because of legal precedent, in other words, you didn't sue them, you'd be unable to shut down things that actually would be harmful to your brand. Now, that said, if they really did actually want to support these guys... They could always, you know, buy the code from them and release it. Yeah, but then then they would have to deal with audiences who were upset about that because there are, you know, suburban moms who don't are think the ponies genuinely should be showing each other their up. five-year-old daughters My Little Pony because they're trying to super shelter their little daughters. That is an audience they actually have to care about. They can't just turn into an internet company, and I, I think the pony scene would not even work if Hasbro was actually playing to the internet. Right. No, it would have fallen apart a while ago. And to no, bring it back to the... I mean, there there are some, like, little nods to the online brony community in videos like the Equestria Girls ad, but... Absolutely, and I, I like it in the very, very small dose that they have it. If it got any more self-aware or any less, like, idealized, if it wasn't such a perfect world that it is sanitized and okay to show to a sheltered suburban child, then the internet would not have the same love for it that it does. But to bring it back to the PlayStation 4, the touchpad on the controller is actually just a tip capacitive touch pad. It does not actually have any screen. It is just a textured surface that is sensitive to touch. So slightly cheaper than the Wii U setup, but still probably ridiculously expensive. No, the facet that really breaks my heart about this is that there are not two shoulder buttons per side on the Vita. Because it is fairly obvious that the design paradigm they're going after with the touch pad on the DualShock 4 is the same paradigm they're going for with the rear touch on the Vita. Which, as far as I'm aware, nobody has done anything interesting with the rear touch on the Vita. But they are so close to just being able to use the Vita as a PlayStation controller, yet so far away because they're missing a pair of shoulder buttons. It's the DualShock 4 connects to the PlayStation 4 using Bluetooth, just like the old DualShocks, although it now has a headset port on it, so you can it comes with a headset in the box, and you can plug it in just like you can plug a headset into the Xbox controller. And the Vita has a Bluetooth radio in it, and a headset jack, and it's like, it is completely in software that you could turn the Vita into a, into a PlayStation 4 controller. Except for that pesky little shoulder buttons. I don't know who made that design decision, but I bet they're kicking themselves right now. So wait, you punished wait. a little bit by being a heavy investor in Sony so, by having to buy a DualShock 4 as well as a Vita. Are you, you actually that insinuating that someone designed the Vita? This... No, they just went to the bathroom and then pulled it out of the toilet? Yeah, this wasn't just a bunch of features thrown wildly at a... Uh... A PSP? Well, that's possibly true. Somebody somebody pulled that out of the toilet, at least. And they're like, man, I really should have done this pooping better. You know, if you can poop hardware features, I'm impressed. Probably a very marketable talent. You could get a lot of jobs that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, I, don't feel like, I don't feel like we've done the Wikipedia trick in that you cl keep clicking on different links to get to a certain subject. We just clicked on different links, and now we're on poop jokes. <laughs> Hold on, let me... Do we want to click on the review subject? Because I can do the review subject. Uh, I want to go over the demos that were shown at the PlayStation event oh, first. Oh, okay. Oh, goody. The very first one was Knack, which is a first-party game 
It is an action platformer, and it is weirdly, like, super cel-shaded and stylized and not seemingly graphically intensive, which is an odd thing to be the first thing shown in your, oh, look at our fancy new hardware. Uh, but it looks cute and cool. It's got this robot that can turn itself into a, a giant robot instead of its tiny, cute, normal robot form. By and picking up miscellaneous dollars. trash in the environment. It's basically a, hey, hey, check out our clutter effects. Yeah, by the way, did anyone else get a bit of a Mega Man feel when they saw the design of all the characters? A little bit. Uh, I can go along with you on that one. Also, yeah, they- did, anyone else, did anyone else notice that you had Commander Femship doing the commander's voice at the very beginning of the trailer? <laughs> ah, that was the Jennifer Hale. I never yeah. got to to check for where Jennifer Hale was actually in the event, but Jennifer Hale's doing the best thing she does. Telling people to get out there and fight. Indeed. Because she is awesome. Next demo was Killzone. It was Killzone. It was a shooter. Nobody cares. I'm just saying like if if Jennifer Hale like recorded army recruitment ads my butt would be enlisted. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You, you, I would, I would go into the army if it meant that Jennifer Hale was giving me, if she was giving me orders. I would take them. You just get an earpiece, and she's mm-hmm. like the Cortana role. I'd sign up for that. Yeah, just have, just have her somewhere in, just have her somewhere on the ship or in the plane or something, and then have her command. I, I'm there. I'm there. Drive Club. It's a racing game. You, you are like, having slightly yeah, yeah, yeah. more hey, ridiculous wait. standards than I am. I just wanted her to do the ad. Yeah, hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. Back up a second here. Actually, no, I'll get to that one in a second. But Drive Club? You guys saw the trailer for that one, right? I it's did cars. not even. There, there, is a tra- there is a trailer for it that apparently they showed at the expo. And literally, it's nothing but about 20 seconds. And none of it looked like it was actual game footage. It looked like something that was ripped from a Top Gear episode. It was literally people getting into cars, cars starting up, and driving really fast. That was it. See, I find it funny that they're not even trying to play this one off as, ooh, it's Gran Turismo. Nope, just like, yeah, that'll be out in like six to eight years. By by the time the console's done its run, we'll have a a Gran Turismo. Seriously, I, I don't think anything that was in their trailer was actually anything they designed. It looks like it was live footage taken of cars. Yeah, I I don't know. I'm still unwilling to believe that anything Killzone is actual in-game footage. Wait, uh, what? Killzone and Drive Club are totally different. Uh, yeah, Sen, we're having two different conversations here. No, I'm not willing to believe that anything that was shown for the PlayStation 4 is real in-game footage until I have the controller in my hand and I'm playing the games. I got... Not Bur- even. I got burned on this with the PlayStation 3. Well, fair enough. But while you're on the subject, though, ain't the trailer I saw for Killzone, it could not have been more underwhelming. It, the whole time... It really was going just uninspired. There, look, it's a beautiful, beautiful world we've created. It does look fabulous. We're going through this city. We're landing a helicopter. I was just waiting. Okay, what's going to blow up? That's what the whole trailer was. It's wait for shit to blow up. Sorry, I shouldn't have cursed. We'll censor it. Pyro, Mark. Got it. All right. But seriously, that's the whole thing. The entire trailer was just waiting for something to blow up, and then stuff happens. That was it. Drive Club looked like super photorealistic, but only for like twenty seconds. So because that's it, all the, that's all the longer it was. Yeah, it was pretty, but I would have liked to see more of it. Like, what exactly is this a game of? Cars. Uh, there will be a <laughs> new Infamous game. Ah, uh, yes, Second Son by Sucker Punch. The previous Infamous games have been pretty popular. Yeah, questionable as to whether we're going to be playing as the main character, Cole McGrath, seeing as one of the endings killed him in the last game. Well, apparently it's not him, I'm guessing. Spoilers, I guess. It's been out for, like, four years. Well, I never played it. You also don't have a PS3, and that was an exclusive. There's that, too. Touche. Also, it seems like this guy does not have lightning powers. He has ember powers. Which we have have seen those in the... uh, the infamous games before. Still, that's a little that's a little non-specific though. He doesn't control fire or anything on the line. It's embers. That's what he's controlling. It's a little well, non-specific, but to be fair, <laughs> Cole's lightning powers extended to quite a bit more than lightning. It was like right. I oh have gosh. lightning powers, which is to say, I'm just a wizard. I can throw. Oh my gosh, up. guys, guys, dude! Uh, just <laughs> had a mind-blowing revelation. Okay. Cole controlling embers. Uh, 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 
Uh, <laughs> folks, yep. if you want to rewind to that Hulk joke in order to to feel like there's good jokes, I'll just you can go ahead and do that. <laughs> also, by the way, the main the main character in this infamous game does he just? Look, I don't know about you guys, but he just looks like a tall jerk. Cole kind of is, but I didn't I see the I trailer, so I couldn't tell you if it was him. Entirely right. depends on how you play Cole. It's not Cole. It's not Cole in this next game. Yeah, all right then. Entirely depends on how you play not Cole. Yes, well, all I can tell is that in this trailer, the guy looks like a complete creep. He looks like the guy you avoid on the street because you know he's going to try to sell you drugs. Hold on, I'm going to try to find a picture of this uh, gentleman. Yeah, find this. Yeah, find this guy. Working on it. Jonathan Blow is going to have a new game. The dude oh, yeah. who made Braid. This There's... new one's called The Witness. Were there any details about it whatsoever, or...? I saw the trailer. I can tell you what it looks like. It looks like a colorful, happy version of Mist. Yeah, that's the exact impression I got watching it. Okay, so... Stuck... Go ahead. We've got the furthest next-gen console ever created, and what are we doing? Mist 3.0! Seriously, you're stuck on an island, and you're going around solving puzzles with lights and very pretty... It looks like a JRPG version of Mist. It's very colorful, it's very bright and vibrant, and the music for the trailer was absolutely gorgeous, but it's Mist. There's no other way of looking at it. It is Mist. It is weird how, like, non-photorealistic... Several of these games have been how Knack is kind of cartoony, and so is The Witness. They're not necessarily trying to push their hardware as hard as I'd expect at this event. And then you get other ones that are just going way too far. Such as Deep Down. Ah, yes, Deep Down by Capcom, Shudder. Boy, this looks a lot like the. Uh, why are From you so. Wait, wait. S Snake, why the Shudder for Capcom? Well, because if memory serves, they're not usually the best for giving a story. Uh, we'll get to that. Capcom's the stu Capcom's the studio behind that uh, Remember Me game that I linked you to, just like yesterday or two Say days what? ago. Uh, Capcom is the developer behind the Remember Me game that I linked you to two days ago. I withdraw my shutter. There we go. No, for now. No, to be fair, Spoilers. Capcom historically has not been well known for their stories. What, with their, In any their longest-running franchise being a story of a blue robot who continuously has to blow up eight other robots, followed by some boss robots. You know, that is that is amongst their most compelling stories, yes. Right. That's and, true. And, and let's not forget the fighting tournament that keeps occurring over and over again, in which, you know, Ryu and Ken don't really age and still appear in every game. Also, you'd think just smashing M. Bison's skull would fix a lot of problems. In any way, I just figured they didn't age because they had like some kind of really awesome diet. <laughs> they only eat prunes and punches to the face. Yep, it's the Muscle secret prunes. to use. Eating fists apparently keeps you alive forever. In any way, apparently, deep down, so, just a working Zen, you title. Test this? Wait, what? No, no. Zen, you want to test this? <laughs> this does not seem like something I want to try. I don't know. It it looks like what you would get if you combined uh, Dark Souls and Monster Hunter. Yet. Yeah. I got a strong, strong Dark Souls imp impression. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Like, huh, it's I, got graphics. It looks gorgeous. I can't argue with that. No, it's got some great graphics. Graphics and the sound was good. Although I couldn't understand a single thing any of the characters were saying in the trailer. Yep, those are some graphics. Let's hope there's a game behind them. Yeah, if that's all pre-rendered cinema, then it has absolutely very little to do with the game when you actually play. Yep. Also. I'm not sure if you guys saw the trailers, but then after that, after the deep down by Capcom, there was a, it was a shot of Blanca emailing Yoshi, or someone named Yoshi. Um, that would be, uh, Onosan, the guy who's actually behind the Street Fighter franchise. He has branched out and is now actually making other games. So, that was a joke? Yeah, that, that was a Capcom in joke. There's okay. an image macro of Onosan <laughs> that's captioned, they said I could be anything. So I became Blanca, and yes. now he's Blanca in the picture. He dressed up as Blanca for a costume party, I believe. Uh-huh. Okay, well, the next one... Huh? I want to group two of the most disappointing things that happened at the press conference together. Square Enix announced that they were making a new Final Fantasy game. 
Well, oh, why do you even need to go on stage and say that? Don't we just kind of assume? Yeah, we kind of just figure you are. It's fine. We can just forget that 13 verses isn't going to happen and be thankful that that universe is being left alone. And then Blizzard's announcement. Uh, Pixie and Which I had both managed indie. to actually tune into the press conference at that point. Okay, you two gotta tell us about this then, because I want to hear about this. Yeah, no, I, go, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, please. Don't take this from me, son. Uh, so, I, I got nothing. They, they go up and they're all like, yeah, Blizzard Entertainment is here at the PS4 announcement launch thing. And they're all like, psyching us up for this big thing. It's like they get up there and then it's like, oh yeah, this is our first foray into console gaming. We're so excited to show you. Is this Ghost? Is this a new property? Blizzard doesn't usually, Blizzard's a PC game company. What's going on? Uh, Port of Diablo 3. Oh my god, I just fell asleep so fast that yeah. I smashed my head on my desk wow. and well, got a concussion. Th this announcement made me laugh really for... hard. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but the way they announced this in the Diablo game like client they... was literally, these are the words that appeared on the screen, Diablo for PlayStation. I'm just like, dude, I played that, uh... I played that when I was like 10. Tell me, was it the numeral four? No, it wasn't. It was oh, okay. F-O-R, so, which made me think, like, why are we announcing Diablo 1 for the PlayStation? I already knew about that. <laughs> That's how I played Diablo 1. Right? Killing the butcher, so going underneath Tristram. Took an entire memory Diablo card 3. to save your characters. <clears throat> Quiet, you two! Let Pixie talk. Thank you. Diablo 3 came out in May, middle of May 2012, so this game is more than eight months old. They're porting it for a console that hasn't yet come out and probably won't come out until the latter part of this year. So, basically, it's like someone... Ugh. ugh. It's like someone knocked up Diablo 3. <laughs> I don't even know. Station. Mm. So basically, when this actually comes out, they'll be porting... It'll be more than a year old. A yes. year old game for a place... Uh, that, yeah. It'll be like a year and a half old by the time this thing comes out, if it comes out this year. Go a home, Blizzard, you're drunk. Kind of got a disappointing reception in the first place, that everybody who wants to play it has already played it, and that... 90% is... of them have already quit? And yes. no one really cares about it anymore. That's the problem. Made I'm worse sorry? by the expectation that... Blizzard has a, a much, like, expected console game that never came out for... Was it the PlayStation 2? Was it that long ago? Oh, God. Uh, likely. The StarCraft Ghost, a first-person character action game. Ah, uh, yes. Particularly since the character of Nova had a fairly prominent role, well, comparatively prominent role, in StarCraft 2 Wings of Liberty. It was like... This is an opportune time to bring that back and actually do a first-person character action game that nobody has seen from Blizzard before. <laughs> and it just didn't happen. Well, it's just, like, Blizzard are the PC game people. They're the absolute last word on PC gaming. We didn't expect them to, like, make this breach into console gaming. They had a chance to really, like, make an earth-shaking change... And then we just got a port for a game that's, like, a year old. What? Then at the same time, there's was a little bit of excitement when Square Enix went on stage, because I'm not even going to tell you, you guys are going to guess. There is something that Square Enix could announce, other than, hey, we're going to make another Final Fantasy game that would drive certain people crazy. Oh, and what would that be, Pyro? Uh, Kingdom Hearts? <gasps> well, that would drive uh, me crazy. That that I would actually be interested in. Me too. But I was thinking of something that had been floating around on the internet for a while. Something that everybody's been expecting Square to eventually announce, and they just haven't gotten around to it yet. Well, don't keep us in suspense, man. An HD remake of Final Fantasy VII. Ah. That's, they, Which they would, did the you trailer. realize, not only be a re-release of an, I, an old IP, but, you know, re-release of an old game. Right. And the reason that the internet was so excited about it, well, is A, because they're crazy nerds about Final Fantasy VII, but B, because they did a graphics trailer where they recreated the introduction to Final Fantasy VII. 
in like super high quality and if you want to really show off the graphical power of this new hardware then maybe having the PlayStation 1 as a touchstone for comparison is not a bad way to do that especially since there's already a fervor around this idea hmm so it was two massive possibilities for hype that were just shot down yep that's what it's, you were telling us it was presented in a very dumb way because they they have these people walk out on stage and then everybody who's watching is like oh my is it this one super exciting thing and then they're like we're proud to announce super boring thing <laughs> go like, oh, well thank you well that was a massive waste of well like who needs sleep aids but in general i would say that the PlayStation event was a very successful, good thing. Like, we got a name, we got hardware specs, which is way more than certain people were expecting. As we know the 8 gigabytes of RAM, we know that it's going to have a PC CPU, so it's going to be easy to develop so, for. So, lots to chew on for you hardware nerds. So, it's, yes. So, there's probably going to be a lot of customization for these things when they come out. And at some point, there may even be some games on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Much it's true. Road. You can't sell the hardware without the software. Like, the, the software is what makes people want to have it. By the way, it's we already like, talked... I gotta have this so that I can play Y. We already talked about Bungie's thing last time, didn't we? Well, yes. kind of. We did not talk about the thing they showed at the PlayStation event, and what they showed at the PlayStation event was almost exactly stuff that they'd shown before. Oh, there were no, there were no revelations about Destiny. Pixie and yeah, I were excited exact. when Bungie came out on stage, and then it was like, hey, we've seen this footage and already. And they just basically did this. Yeah, you same. get to customize your space marine as you fight aliens, and you get massive co-op and competitive play. <gasps> huh? Talk about... Well... It's like, yes, this is all exciting, but you announced this last week, Bungie. Not to mention the fact that, well, Bungie, you're Bungie. I mean... Space marine's not new territory, is what you're saying? What I'm saying is, there's one trick pony, and then there's one trick elephant. Pony? <laughs> it's funny, no, no, guys, the pony, because... No, no, the pony thing got shut down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, good point. I mean, it looks good, but it's inevitably just going to be constantly compared to Halo, because it's Bungie. But I mean, just... uh, multiplayer to be shooter... Fair, I think 343 did a fantastic job with Halo 4. Well, yeah, but... Again... again it, what I'm saying is, though, Bungie wanted to stick with the whole Space Marine stuff. Why didn't they just stick with, you know, their Space Marine? I don't have anything against 343. What I'm saying is, if Bungie wanted to do this, why didn't they just stick with the franchise that's going to automatically, you know, make them wealthy anyway? Uh, I don't know. Par probably partly because the uh, Halo universe revolves around the Master Chief, and this is supposed to be more about customizing and multiplayer and, like, stuff more, like, user-centric. Yeah, I guess so. Well, 343 is even doing... 343 is doing that, too, with the Halo 4 multiplayer. Although it kind of reeks a, lot, a bit too much of uh, Mass Effect 3's multiplayer, but anyway. They just seem to have wanderlust. They made Marathon, and they were successful, and they made Oni, and got it published by Rockstar, and then they made Halo... And now they're making Destiny, and it's just Space Marine, Space Marine, Space Marine, Space Marine. I guess they, I guess they say, write what you know. <laughs> if it ain't broke, I guess. There's that too. If it ain't broke, repackage it and sell it again. Multiplayer shooters, however, can sort of get away with that because they're so, well, multiplayer. And mm -hmm. I guess I'm going to transition into the Devil May Cry thing here is that if you're going to play a thing over and over, it can't be single player. Like, at least for me personally, I am willing to play a multiplayer thing repeatedly, but not a single player thing. I don't have time for that. Multiplayer uh -huh. has added value because you're hanging out with your friends. Single player, it's just like, well, I'm making this bar fill up and making this number get big, but uh, that doesn't get me off. Well, actually, can I just talk about one other game that they presented? Sure, go for it. Well, this one almost seems like the one that they're trying to... That if you're trying to see what's going to be their title game or might end up being the one that's they might want to <gasps> oh my have goodness. prominently on the front. I apologize but, for skipping this, because, yeah, this is, this is probably the most important demo. 
Yes, I'm guessing you know what I'm talking about, but this seems like, you know, what the one that they're hoping is going to be their saving grace or their halo right now. Watch Dogs. We saw this at the you, previous E3, but they weren't able to announce that it was actually for next generation consoles because the Although whole industry it was, was basically a thing that everybody kind of assumed because it was like this doesn't look like a current jet game. Actually, no, yeah. they they did mention during that press release during E3 that look, this thing can't be released on current gen consoles. So while they couldn't announce that, yeah, PS4 and Xbox 720 are coming, they made it very clear that this was not coming out. For, yeah, but they uh, talked around gen. it in such a fashion that it's like maybe it's a PC only game. They they didn't yeah, ever they say the words PCs. next generation consoles. Mm-hmm. And everybody knew it, but they were just performing this ridiculous charade. Right. But no, no, we're not we're not doing next generation consoles anytime soon. Now they can give it up. Yeah, but the thing is though this was like the only one of the all the trailers that really got me interested because it seemed so different in because it seemed rather unique. I'm one that really likes story and world building, and this one seemed like it was taking that to its most extreme. I mean, when I saw the trailer, it made me think Grand Theft Auto taken to its extremist. Absolutely. Uh, The thing it it was reminding me of was Assassin's Creed, especially Mm -hmm. since the very first frame they do the trick where they put up the Ubisoft logo, and then Mm -hmm. they do the graphical glitching on it, which is... They might have introduced that in Brotherhood, but that's a a trademark of the Assassin's Creed series. It's like, man, all of the UI design is the same. It's it's Ubisoft, and they're using their same engine, like, visual design, at least. The UI elements look similar. And I have no problem with that, because the Assassin's Creed series has a lot of problems, but the UI design is not one of them. Mm-hmm. And I was watching a tra- I was watching the trailer once with the designer. It is amazing how easily you can win my heart with a good UI. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Too true. But one of the designers was saying for this game that there's going to be no specific objectives given. In fact, when in the demo they were showing, what they were given was not objectives. What the, the screen wasn't giving you objectives to do. It said suggested action. And that is brilliant. Like, that kind of made my heart flutter when it was like, suggested action. Go like, chase down this can, criminal. You can do that, or but you, you don't have not. to. Because that's the thing that everyone always complains about with open world free roaming ones that say that you can do whatever you want, but really you're just being given a bunch of these little tasks to do over and over again. That's why I never liked Grand Theft Auto, because it says it's world building, but it's really not. But I would like to suggest uh, Saints Row to you if you have not played it. But Yeah, I've heard about that too. But, but this one, I have to admit, I really like the concept of going around and picking your own sections to do. And it seems like real big world building. I just, I love the concept, but I'm a little bit worried that it's going to end up being, might end up being a little too much grind. And also it might be a bit too much of an undertaking because the way they have this set up, they need to make this massive. There's so many different little elements they need to focus on. And it'll be the little parts that really can get, that, that'll be really important. Actually being able to give you enough different tools to work with so that you can actually interact in this world, but... That chase scene looked so cool. Oh, yes, the chase scene looked so awesome, being able to go around and get the guy, uh, seeing everyone's little profile to see which Using person... Using the traffic you're... stopper, oh, oh my yeah. god. Using bullet time, stopping the train, use, uh, checking everyone's profile to see who's the best one to get money from. Yeah, it said one was the... The, the hobo on the side was a, world, was a veteran. Uh, the woman was like a teacher or something like that and the other guy was uh, some ge- some CEO of a tobacco company making $117,000 a year so we'll take his bank account but when you start with the parkour basis of Assassin's Creed which is kind of like inherently fun like mm-hmm. you can put a lot of any sort of window dressing on that parkour and have it be very enjoyable and then the window dressing is something as exciting as you have this access to modern technology like assassin's creed games are in the renaissance area there's no cell phones that can launch concrete poles out of a road right in front of a speeding cop car in the renaissance era that's, that's some exciting window dressing. Yeah, that's some impressive work in that you can literally go anywhere and literally do pretty much anything you want. I and mean, that's that's what games have always been want. Watching that's that made what... me want to play Shadowrun. Not even going to lie. Yeah, but this, but this is the kind of thing that games have always been you know, wanting to do. Put you in a world where you could literally do anything you want. And this seems almost like a game that's trying to do just that. 
And, and I have to say, this was the one trailer of all the other ones that really got me excited, that I was actually really interested in. Well, it got my cyberpunk rocks off, and it's a definite will play. Oh, yeah. It, it might be, yeah. But that I, means Pyro, uh, well, I mean, assuming that, that doesn't, that's going to be out on a PC, can we assume that? I'm fairly confident that it will be, yes. Yeah, because mm-hmm. otherwise it's like you're going to have to get a console. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Not necessarily. I can mooch off one of yours. Uh-huh. Well, in any case, it seems almost like Watch Dogs is a reason they saved that for last, because it seems like that's the one that they're going to be holding up as, like, their main game for the PS4. I feel like that's one that they're going to be pushing the most. They did not actually hold it for last. They put Watch Dogs right between Final Fantasy and Diablo 3. Okay, well, I'm going off of the Escapist article, Okay. So, excuse me, sorry. So you can cut that line of mine out then. But it was like, oh, oh that was really dumb. Oh my goodness, I am way into this. This is awesome. Oh, that was so dumb. Well, maybe Destiny is dumb, okay, I guess. You have to look dumb. <laughs> well, maybe, well, maybe PlayStation 4 will realize that. Because seriously, this is the only one. And by the way, can I backtrack real for a second here? For the Kill Zone Shadowfall trailer, did anyone else notice that the main character stabbed Cyber Altair? I missed that. That's what it is. You go in, you walk up to the building, it blows up, and you see Cyber Altair come up to you and almost shoot you. Now that you mention it, I know what you're talking about. It's it's Cyber Altair. I have no other way of putting it. Ooga booga. Character designers just got lazy, copied the same thing. Yeah, tell me that is not Robo Altair. Because it is. Anyway, sorry, I just wanted to back up. I just wanted to say that because I forgot to mention it. Anyway, that's my ranting. I just really wanted to talk about that that one game I was really passionate about. So, moving on then. Well, this show might even cover our entire WLRA time slot, because Jesus. Sen and Pixie played Devil May Cry. Or rather, DMC like? Devil May Cry. Tell me about it, Pixie. Um, it's a Devil May Cry game. It features a much younger Dante trying to figure out, like, who he is and where he belongs in things, and I guess there's some conspiracy that I wasn't paying too much attention to it. I don't generally like the Devil May Cry games, or games that play like them. I, I just find them incredibly dull. It's just repeatedly doing the same thing over and over again, and the points harken to an arcade era that's long gone, where the points are meaningless and don't really do anything, and get arbitrarily graded on your combat, and... It's really just spamming the same buttons over and, uh, it's, it's I not my cup of tea. I am a staunch defender of the Mako in the first Mass Effect, and I think the reason that I liked it was because when it happened in the game, it was a new system, fairly late, and it was like, okay, I've been doing sort of one type of thing, and then here's this totally different type of thing I can do. And I always love when games introduce new types of things to do as needed and that's one of the reasons i like the assassin's creed games is because you have your core of running around and stabbing people but there's a lot of different types of things to do and they will introduce them fairly late like you will wind up flying a fake airplane like three quarters of the way through assassin's creed 2 (laughs) yeah hang glider that for some reason gets ridiculous air boosts off of bonfires Maybe playing a little fast and loose with the physics there. But it was a new system that they introduced super, super Video late into the game. Video games being cavalier about being realistic with the physics? <laughs> well, shock me dead. And the thing that turns me off about Devil May Cry is because I have no faith that they're going to introduce new systems for me later. I just, I'm playing this and I'm confident that this is all there is to the whole game. Sen, are you away? around? Yeah, I'm here. No, he's not. Okay. Okay. Stop. I was going to say some not radio-friendly things, so why don't we just jump right in? <laughs> Sen, what were your impressions of Devil May Cry? Um, well, as a series relaunch, it's always really hard for the new studio being handed a... I, I hesitate to say beloved franchise, because let's face it, Devil May Cry has never been a great series for storytelling or or let's let's face it Dante's not a great character and the the loyalty that the character spawns seems to be honestly entirely unwarranted 
Like, what? what's Dante's big thing? I'm good at what he's I do. He's kind of hot. I'm, That's basically it. <laughs> he's physically appealing. He's a, a complete jerk and has the attitude of a, like, houseplant otherwise. Like, you, you genuinely don't know a ton about this character because all you know that is... That intro cutscene, though? Yum. <laughs> <laughs> so, taking this chance to go back and redefine what the character is to make him more appealing to a Western audience seems to have been a good idea for uh, developer Ninja Theory. I mean, these are the guys who added character through their animations more than anything. Um, it's definitely seen when you play Heavenly Sword, when you play Enslaved. These are the guys who do motion capture and facial, facial animations that tell all of the story. Also, for some reason, the very, very opening cutscene looked terrible. Like a PS2 game. And, and then every other scene after it looked great. And so we can't enough, really figure out what... It I actually went back and played that cutscene again, Pix. And yeah. it really seems like it was the... Uh, the PS3 has an issue with in-scene rendering. And it seems like some of the layers of animation did not render on that initial So did playthrough. it look different? Yeah, it looked better. Not great, but better. I don't know. Because it looked really terrible that first time we played it. Well, it, interesting thing to note, the female character in that scene, Lilith, looks terrible to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so that was rendering properly. But later scenes when we saw the same office and Mundus had rendered properly, he actually looks really cool. All right, then. Fair enough. So, yeah, there there might have just been a loading issue, but, uh... Which still is a mark against it, mind. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, I, I despise it when I'm watching a cutscene, and I can watch all of the layers of shading come in on the background. It looks even worse when it's doing it on a character that's center screen and close-up. So, yeah, um... Overall, the game tries for more of a story than any previous Devil May Cry did, with the exception of maybe three. I will, I will give it that. It's like I was kind of interested a little bit in what was going on, and it did like a lot to fill in the holes for me from uh, not really playing any of the other DMC games. Well, it it takes its own route away from the other D uh, Devil May Cry games. Uh, for instance, the concept of Devil May Cry 1 and 2 was, you are Dante... He's a demon hunter. You're going to go kill some demons. Uh, Devil May Cry 3 was the first one that actually had a real plot in that, you know, Dante is out to stop his brother from wiping out the human race, because he's kind of a jerk. This one takes place in an alternate timeline, they say, because, you know, I guess you have to give credit to the people who like the original story. I don't know. I like this better. Uh, basically, demons have enslaved all of humanity, uh, at least all of the humanity in this city, because that's the only city that's mentioned in this game, um, using a variety of methods, uh, heavy-handed news reporting, uh, social control, a spiked soft drink. All, all of this is, is pretty, you I'm know... Going to, I'm going to assume that it's literally got, like, pointy horns coming out of it. The the drink? No, it's it's, yes. it's laced with demon juice, basically, that is... As they describe it, a lobotomy in a can. Meanwhile, everyone's brainwashed by the Raptor News Network, who... Th there's There are a few ways that the the person who operates this network could look more like a real-life uh, news pundit. There, there's a, juice sounds like a sex thing. I was just writing that. It sounds like something squicky in um, Shadows of the Damned. I'm honestly not going to put it past it being that. I killed the thing that makes it. I don't know what orif it was, orifice it was coming out of, and I don't want to know. I just killed it. Suffice to say, the thing was called a succubus. Um, so yeah. Suck your innuendo. Da Dante and his brother and this girl named Cat, who is new to the series, because there's always a girl introduced to the series in every Devil May Cry game. Whether she makes it to is she the one with the cute butt? Well, yeah, whether she makes it to the sequel is entirely open to the creators. Dante it's does not have for the a... listeners the second time. Yes, she is the one with the cute butt. Yes, okay. confirmed. Just, just checking. She's the one that appears in the first cutscene, or sorry, the second cutscene of the game, and immediately is presented with a full view of Dante's uh, smaller sword. <laughs> I, I appreciate that joke. 
And then there's, like, a really awesome, like, cinematic of him, like, jumping through the air and dressing himself prior to a boss fight. As his trailer is ripped uh, forward through him. Yeah, it was kind of awesome. Right, they, they do that very well. The cutscene... The, careful, the carefully placed flying objects covering his, you know, bait and tackle. Pulling in Austin Powers, if you will. Quite. Yep. Using a baseball bat and later a slice of pizza. Yeah, the, the game's cutscenes are phenomenal. Like, they got Dante's attitude down in a way that actually makes him more appealing than the previous Dante. You know, he has actual more motives More appealing here. than a vegetable, as you had said? Yes. Uh, the original Dante did not have much personality to him besides, hey, look at me, I'm smug. This Dante actually seems to have, you know, motives and goals, things that he wants to do, things that he'll fight for. Like, there, there's actually some worth here in this new version of the character. And, and Ninja Theory did go out of their way to acknowledge the previous games. There's this really great moment in the first level where a white wig lands atop Dante's head, and he takes a few seconds to admire himself in the mirror besides saying, not in a million years, and ripping it off. Um, when Dante unlocks his Devil Trigger ability, his hair starts to go gray in patches. When he activates it, his hair goes completely white. Like, we definitely have those nods. So, you were mentioning a specific dislike of the button-mashing gameplay, as you put it. Mm-hmm. Re it. Realistically, that's one option. Um, as well, it stands, the game... Realistically, that's how people will play it. <laughs> No. I potentially have plenty of ex respect for the actual character action component of it. Like, okay, there's people who are going to want to get their combos exactly right and do this on hardcore mode and play the entire game in one sitting without taking a hit. Uh, but that's... And the feel of that action is important. Like, the how the combos are structured can be better or worse. Right. But if it is only that... If that's the only gameplay mechanic then I'm kind of out no matter how good that is. Well, as the game progresses, you run into enemies who are specifically vulnerable to certain styles of moves. Uh, by using the R2 and L2 triggers, Dante can switch between angelic weapons and demonic weapons. Uh, the angelics being the uh, scythe and the spinning discs, the demonic being the axe and the flaming fist weapons. And likewise, you have the neutral rebellion sword, which is just your neutral weapon. There are certain enemies in the game that can only be harmed by one or the other. And likewise, there's just more efficient weapons for better situations. If you're surrounded by a bunch of weak enemies, using your spinning discs or scythe is the proper way to go. If you're fighting one large enemy, using the heavy-hitting but uh, single-target demonic weapons... Uh, will suit your needs better. But if you really just want to attack most things with your generic sword, apart from those enemies who are going to be invulnerable to one or the other, you can do that. Especially if you're playing the game on the easy human setting. The game actually becomes difficult when you try it on the neutral demon hunter setting or the, uh, or the ultimate setting, the Nephilim setting. Which, man, all I, of the I gotta say, unlocked I think the, the Nephilim or... cliche needs to go. I, I played as a Nephilim three times this year. Go ahead, Pyro. Are all of the difficulties unlocked out of the gate, or do you, you, does it require multiple playthroughs to start on the higher difficulties? As I understand it, the... What I have seen is the three starting difficulties being Human, Demon Hunter, and Nephilim. I'm willing to bet, and I, I have not looked this up, someone else can if they really care to, I'm willing to bet there is a hidden difficulty, the Dante Must Die difficulty, which has been in every previous game. I would be legitimately surprised if that didn't make an appearance again. It seems like a relative certainty. Yeah. But... So you think that the that the character action is tight and it feels good and the combos are interesting? I find this this fighting is more appealing to me than the fighting found in any previous Devil May Cry game, and I was a huge fan of the third one. 
or in other recent 3D fighting games. Uh, but seeing as you just played Revenge, as a, yeah, I just one played one of these, and in fact, previously I'd played Darksiders Two, which again I had trouble with the fighting system in. This is smooth. It encourages smart gameplay rather than just complete button mashing, especially when you get to the later opponents. It is a nice combat system. Ninja Theory did a great job, and this is praising their uh, previous experiences, too. It plays very much like a cleaned-up Heavenly Sword. But is there anything other than just the character action sequences? Is that just it? You know, I'd, I'd say if you enjoy uh, Rebellion Against the Establishment stories, there's something to be enjoyed in the story. Um... The other thing that I was really impressed with in the game is the environments. I utterly love the environments that the game throws you into, especially some of the later ones. Like, when you're taking on the Raptor News Network, you effectively spend a sequence platforming in what is effectively the Colbert Report logos. <laughs> nice. Like, it is the same color scheme. It is, like, thick primary colored bars shooting past you, it is really entertaining to do that section. And you end up fighting, like, a digitalized persona of that character. It's really cool. Likewise, the scene uh, immediately afterwards where you invade uh, Lilith's nightclub, you're basically fighting in music bars. Like, the whole level is shifting with the music. The platforming sections get really awesome. And that's something that is really, really hard to do for a game, to make platforming interesting. Particularly in 3D. I'm yeah. not sure I've liked a 3D platformer since Mario 64. The, the different forms of the uh, chain attack that Dante performs, uh, if you use the angelic mode of it, it pulls you towards the point. If you use the demonic form of it, it pulls the point towards you. Having access to both of those, as well as the angelic swoop mode that propels Dante further forward than normal, um, allows for interesting platforming, but it's the environments that are just cool. The environments and the soundtrack that just perfectly matches every scene in the game, they actually got licensed music in it that works. It's really good. They, they nailed cool. the tone of the franchise perfectly, to the point where I think is this is actually going to replace the default tone of the previous games. Is there any multiplayer? There is not. Okay. Well, it, to some degree, that's almost satisfying because multiplayer is so prevalent nowadays. The, the uh, only... I hear that you and Pixie were playing Passion Play. Yeah, yeah, we were exchanging controller. It seems like I'd like there to be hooks for Passion Play in games, like built into the software. Things that encourage like, yeah. you to... There's no way. Yeah. There is no way that will ever be a thing. You can't even get local co-op most of the time because they want you to buy your own copy. Right. Why on earth would they encourage you to share a copy with someone? No, there, there is... This is, by the, this is incidentally the one reason that, you know, I actually would like us to review Army of Two, the, the next game that's due out this next month. Not gonna argue. Even though we were severely underwhelmed by the last one. Right. Um... The only thing that's making me hesitant to completely recommend a purchase on this one is the the lack of true replayability. Um, replayability in this game comes in the form of replaying levels you previously cleared with the other weapons unlocked to break through some doors and barriers and puzzles. Uh, so, for instance, in the first level of the game, almost immediately you encounter a door that can only be broken with the Demonic Fist which you don't unlock until, like, the eighth level of the game. So, oh, man. It that is, like, that is Lego Star Wars level replayability. Yeah. That is literally exactly how they do that in Lego Star Wars. Right, but beyond collecting pickups to unlock other items and receive, like, S-ranks, which, as Pix pointed out, holds no real value apart from unlocking other upgrades, there, there's no real replay value here. Uh, they are releasing DLC packs, which allow you to play as different characters and tell different parts of the story. Uh, the first one being the Fall of Virgil. Spoiler, I guess? I don't know. Alright, yeah. so DMC seems pretty good. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great game. Um, I'm very pleased that I rented it rather than uh, purchased it right off the bat. 
Supposedly, if you want the best graphical uh, representation of the game, the way to go is PC. Uh, the fra- yeah, the that's frame rates always are always the case. Yeah, the frame rates are supposedly until next generation consoles happen. Yep. Good. Uh, as I was saying, the the frame rates are supposedly much smoother. Hit smoother. I'm making up words now. Smoother, which is like smoother. Smoother. <laughs> Uh, again, the, day off. the PlayStation yeah. 3 version seems to I'm have trouble that. with uh, having graphics load in that. during scenes. I'm not sure how the 360 version of it plays, but oh well. I I personally really enjoy it. If you have a fast PC, take advantage of it. If you don't, the consoles are passable. It's also available on Steam, so yeah. It makes getting it like super easy. <laughs> that... That really makes me more likely to buy a game in general. Right. But as much as I like uh, the democracy of the internet, the fact that anybody can put a game on the internet and just make it available to people, I'm more likely to buy a game on Steam than a self-published game. Right. But we Uh-oh. are just about of time, out of time on our time slot on WLRA, so... Wow. Pixie, you want to take us out? All right, so... um, yeah, Wow, this was a long one, guys. You're getting your money's worth. All no, zero dollars. Oh, 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 sorry, I fell asleep there for a second. What what happened? Blizzard announced Diablo the 3 for the PlayStation 4. And oh, there he goes. I don't want to live on this planet anymore. Anywho, um, from all of us here at Nerd Talk, uh, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. I'm Pyrosim. And I'm Snake. And you've been listening to the Nerd Talk Podcast. We'll catch you next week. <laughs>